Hi, I'm Dr. Ivan Matthews. I'm here today to talk to you about exercise metabolism. So before we talk about exercise metabolism, let's just spend a quick moment here talking about energy use at rest. So when we are resting, almost 100% of our ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, that smallest unit of energy the body uses, so almost 100% of that ATP is being produced aerobically, which means we're not using a lot of anaerobic metabolism in order to make our energy. All right, so it doesn't mean we're not doing any anaerobic metabolism, so when you look at blood lactate levels at rest, which is produced only from glycolysis, which is an anaerobic pathway, we do have a little bit of blood lactate. Typically, though, it's less than one millimoles per liter of blood. All right, so most of our energy is being produced aerobically, which means it's using oxygen in order to make that energy. When we are at rest, most people are going to use approximately 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body mass per minute of just sitting um, in order to just sustain themselves and to produce the energy that they need aerobically. So this 3.5 has been turned into a constant that we call one met. So 3.5 mLs per kg per minute is one met. All right, so again, that's the metabolic equivalent of rest. So this is sometimes going to be brought up, uh, especially when you're looking at exercise prescriptions, and you're gonna see sometimes that people use METs in order to prescribe exercise. It's just a nice, uh, easy way of prescribing exercise. Now that we've talked about energy at rest, Again, it was almost all aerobic energy at rest. Let's talk about the transition from rest to exercise. All right, so looking at this graph here, there's a lot going on, but let's break this down. So on the x-axis here, we have time, and you can see that it starts negative, and then the zero line here for time is when we start exercise, and then we have an increase in time after that. All right, on our y-axis, we have um, two different things. We have VO2, which is oxygen consumption, which is something we need in order to produce energy aerobically. And we have ATP use or energy use. This light blue color here represents aerobic metabolism, where this red color, um, this light red, represents anaerobic metabolism, so energy is produced without oxygen. All right, so again, at rest here, the, these first couple minutes are um, almost entirely, uh, the energy is almost entirely supported with aerobic metabolism, so it's all blue. Once we hit this dotted line where we start exercise, you're gonna see that the this goldish color line that is the ATP is going to immediately shoot up to meet the needs of of the exercise intensity that we are trying to, to perform at. All right, if it didn't, you wouldn't be able to do the exercise. We immediately have this increase in ATP um, use, and that's going to plateau at whatever level our exercise is. So in other words, you go from rest to maybe turning on the treadmill at three miles an hour and walking. So the, the treadmill doesn't change, it's just set at three miles per hour. So energy use is gonna go up and it's gonna stay that at that level until you change your exercise intensity again. All right, notice though this, this blue dotted line, this is our oxygen consumption. It has a little bit of a delay and it eventually does reach what is necessary in order to per perform all of this exercise with aerobic metabolism. But we have this period here where you can see that anaerobic metabolism has to take over. This period, uh, this delay in the oxygen consumption uh, causes what we call the oxygen deficit. So the oxygen deficit is just the period of time after we increase exercise intensity or when we transition from rest to exercise um, between that period between that and whenever the aerobic metabolism and the oxygen consumption catches up to fully support the exercise load. So during that period, it is all going to be anaerobic metabolism that is going to support this transition. And you can see if we then increase exercise intensity again, so this dotted line is another increase in exercise intensity, we have another a period where there's an oxygen deficit and eventually the VO2 does catch up and then supplies 100% of the energy needs for that exercise intensity. If you keep doing this, so if you keep increasing the exercise intensity after one, after the next, after the next, um, like what is being shown here, eventually you're going to hit an exercise intensity like this top one here where you cannot support the exercise totally with aerobic metabolism. So you notice we have this increase in energy usage and it plateaus at whatever intensity. So maybe this is eight miles per hour on a treadmill and the aerobic metabolism goes up trying to meet that need, but it can't get all the way there. So it does plateau before that the, it reaches enough uh, oxygen consumption in order to produce all the energy aerobically. 
So at this point in time and thereafter, so if you keep increasing exercise intensity, you're going to have a mixture between aerobic energy and anaerobic energy that is supporting that exercise intensity. All right, so again, though, anytime we are able to meet the exercise intensity aerobically, but we have a delay in the oxygen consumption, that period of uh, that red area here where it's supported by anaerobic, metab anaerobic metabolism is called the oxygen deficit. So you're going to have a little bit of lactic acid being produced anytime you have these little uh, sections here where anaerobic metabolism is required in order to uh, hit and then maintain the exercise intensity. Um, that also means that you're going to have more hydrogen being released into the blood. Hydrogen is acid, all right? So the hydrogen comes from the lactic acid, all right? So um, one thing that's important to note here is that an individual who is trained in order to do this type of exercise, they're going to have a much smaller oxygen deficit, which means their, their VO2 is going to increase much faster, allowing them to meet the energy needs of the exercise bout through aerobic metabolism. If they are able to increase their VO2 faster, that means again, less lactic acid, less anaerobic metabolism, less hydrogen buildup, so less muscle burning, less fatigue, less of all of those things, uh, which is a good thing. Um, typically, uh, for a person who is average and untrained, you're talking about uh, an increase from rest to a sort of moderate intensity exercise requiring somewhere between one and four minutes for them to reach a steady state with their aerobic metabolism. So in other words, this VO2 getting to the flat line here and fully supporting the exercise intensity. All right, so it's going to be a little longer for the higher intensities, a little shorter for the uh, lower intensities. So if you're going up to, you know, from rest to two miles per hour, maybe it's going to take a minute for the oxygen consumption to reach what you need. Where if you go to something that's maybe, you know, six miles per, per hour on a treadmill, which for most people is going to be moderate to vigorous exercise intensity. Now it's going to take probably around a minute and a half, two minutes, maybe up to three minutes. Typically it's around two minutes though, um, before that exercise intensity. Um, is mostly or fully supported by aerobic metabolism and we essentially just uh, get again to a plateau which we call a steady state. When we stop exercise, so we just covered rest, we covered a couple stages of increasing stages of exercise intensity, but when we get to this dotted line here, this is when we stop exercise, we go from you know eight miles per hour on a treadmill to immediately stopping and sitting down and doing nothing. Um, the energy needs are going to go down quickly, but they don't go down to zero immediately. And also we continue to use a lot of oxygen, a lot more than what we would need at rest. So notice that the oxygen consumption and the ATP line is much higher here than it is over here when both conditions are us resting. Um, so this period uh, after the exercise where we continue to consume a lot of oxygen and use up a lot of ATP and produce a lot of ATP, we call this the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption or EPOC for short. So EPOC can be split into, the period of EPOC can be split into two different smaller periods. A rapid portion where you see this very quick decrease in oxygen consumption happening. That's the rapid portion of EPOC. And then a slow component where you see a much more shallow line here. It's not going down quite as quickly anymore. Um, and the, the slow component always happens after the rapid component. So this is, you know, let's say you're running really fast on a treadmill and you stop and you sit down and you continue breathing really heavy for a period of time. And then as you start to slow your breathing back towards normal, this, that's probably where this transition happens from the um, rapid component of EPOC to the slow component of EPOC. And these two components are important because what's happening during those components are a little bit different. All right, so before I get into that though, let's just, uh, let me just cover one quick thing here. So we have these periods of oxygen deficit when you increase exercise intensity or started exercise where your body had to use anaerobic energy in order to support the exercise bout. And um, you would think that this, this post-exercise oxygen consumption, excess oxygen consumption, or EPOC, would be there to replenish the oxygen, the O2 deficit, so to get rid of that deficit. And a small part of it is for that, so, but it's only around 20% that is sort of repaying the oxygen deficit. So EPOC is about much more than repaying the oxygen deficit. All right, the, rapid portion of 
the epoch period is primarily going to be us resynthesizing our phosphocreatine stores. So whenever you exercise anaerobically, the first um, energy system that's going to get used up is your phosphocreatine stores. So the rapid portion of the um, recovery from exercise the, of the epoch period is going to be resynthesizing this phosphocreatine and then also replenishing that oxygen deficit that we mentioned already. Once we get into the slow component, the part that takes a lot longer for us to get all the way back down to rest, now we're not really repl replenishing the oxygen deficit anymore. We're not really uh, building up our phosphocreatine stores again. Um, that's already done. So what's happening here is essentially it's driven by uh, our, our hormones. All right? So we have elevated metabolism for a, a long period after an exercise about that's going to be driven by um, hormones and nor called it's going to be driven by hormones and neurotransmitters that were released into the bloodstream, things like epinephrine and norepinephrine that we associate with the sympathetic nervous system, which both of which are going to increase our metabolic rate. Um, and we're also, during this period of time, going to be converting whatever lactic acid was produced um, back into glucose, something called gluconeogenesis, um, or turning it back into pyruvate which in the, within the muscle and using it in order to just do a metabolism normally. So again, the rapid component is resynthesizing re our phosphocreatine stores and replenishing the O2 that's been uh, depleted during this oxygen deficit um, that happened. And then the slow component, this more shallow component of epoch, is there because of changes in our hormones um, that just ramp up our metabolism for a period of time, and so we can get rid of the lactic acid that is in our muscles and in our blood. It's important to note that just like with the oxygen deficit when I said earlier that the greater the exercise intensity the more the oxygen deficit is going to be um, in other words the longer it's going to take for the VO2 to raise up to what it needs to be and become a, a nice steady state to support the exercise intensity we also have the greater the exercise intensity the greater the epoch is going to be so in other words we need to do these things that happen during the slow and rapid components of the epoch more after an, an intense bout of exercise versus a more moderate bout of exercise so a moment ago i mentioned that during the slow component of the excess post-oxygen consumption, the epoch period, um, that one of the things that is happening is our body is dealing with the lactic acid that was produced by glycolysis and anaerobic metabolism. Um, it's important for us to understand the the period of time that it, this our bodies need to deal with this. Right, and this is going to differ depending on if we're doing a passive recovery, like what was mentioned before. So in other words, you're doing whatever exercise about you, you did, and then you immediately stop and sit down and do nothing, or just stand and do nothing. Or an active recovery, when you stop the vigorous bout of exercise, but now you're doing a, a slower, less vigorous uh, exercise. Think of like a cool down. Uh, right, so... The purple is no cooldown, the green is cooldown. So if you're looking at this, um, the blood lactate levels are gonna initially go up just a little bit after the exercise bout. And this is essentially it going from inside the muscle to leaking out and getting into the blood. So it takes a little time for that to happen. And then if you do an active recovery, so a cooldown, you're gonna see a, a faster decrease in your blood lactate levels than if you do nothing and just do a passive recovery. It's gonna take a little bit longer for that blood lactate to go away. Please note though that the difference between an active recovery and a passive recovery isn't that great. Um, so basically you come almost down to resting levels with an active recovery in about 40 minutes where it takes probably 60, 70 minutes to get to around that same level with a passive recovery. So it does take about twice as long if you do a passive recovery to get rid of the lactic acid. However, both of these, you're going to have no lactic acid left in your muscles and in your blood after approximately two hours, maybe a little longer, maybe a little less, depending on the individual and the intensity of the exercise bout. This exercise bout that we're seeing here is a very intense one. This is probably repetitive sprints that would produce a lot of lactic acid. The active recovery that we're talking about here, again, we're not talking about anything 
real intense that actually the more intense you make it probably the worse off you are you just want to keep moving keep blood flowing through those muscles and that blood's going to flush out the lactic acid so that the entire body sort of deals with the lactic acid so again we have this sort of peak this spike that happens as we're flushing it out into the blood and then the whole body can then get involved and try to deal with the lactic acid all right so the exercise intensity that we're looking for 30 to 40 percent of your vo2 max so this is a very low exercise intensity we're talking a brisk walk to a very slow jog for most people all right so active recovery should be a very light bout of exercise it should not be a continuation of uh, vigorous intensity all right so where's all this lactic acid going all right we again we got rid of all the lactic acid within an hour to two hours for most people. Um, so 70% of the lactic acid is going to be uh, oxidized. And so basically we're turning it back into pyruvic acid and then we're going to have it enter the Krebs cycle and aerobic metabolism and we just utilize it just like we would have if it would have never become lactic acid in the first place and if that pyruvic acid just went right into the Krebs cycle uh, in the first place. So 70% 70, 70 of it is just converted back to the pyruvate and used aerobically to make energy. Um, and this is going to happen inside the active muscle. Um, some people also believe it's happening in the adjacent muscle fibers that were not active or that were less active. That's something called the lactate shuttle. Um, and we also have other tissues that are very good at utilizing lactic acid in this way, um, the heart being one of those. So the cardiac muscle is very, very good at taking in lactic acid from the bloodstream, converting it to pyruvic acid, and then using it aerobically for its own uses. Um, so that's 70% of where the lactic acid goes. 20% of it is going to be converted to glucose in the liver. Um, so we're talking about gluconeogenesis, so creating uh, glucose from something that was not glucose. So converting lactic acid into a glucose. And when it's happening in the liver like this, um, we have a name for it, it's called the Cori cycle. So the Cori cycle is nothing more than the blood lactate getting into the blood, eventually getting into the liver and the liver turning it into glucose. And then about 10%, so a very small percentage of the lactic acid is converted through other means into amino acids, so um, the building blocks of our body essentially. So um, that's where the lactic acid goes. Again, most of it is gone within an hour, hour and a half, definitely within two hours in the vast majority of people, even in extremely vigorous bouts of exercise. We've hinted at this a little bit already, but let's talk about it um, in more detail here. So if we were to go from rest to vigorous intensity exercise right away, so in other words, you, you stand up and you sprint, okay? Um, what happens, what energy systems are going to support that exercise? So what we have here on this graph is somebody doing exactly what I just said. They, they go from rest, they stand up, and they start to sprint, and they continue to work at their maximal ability. Even as they fatigue, yes, their maximal ability is going to come down, um, which is being shown by this dotted black line here. So they, they're sprinting, they're sprinting, they start to slow down because they're fatiguing, they slow down a little more, and then they do this, they just keep pushing as hard as they can for as long as they can, and this graph stops around two hours, all right? So if somebody were to do this, the first one to three seconds of that exercise about um, being shown here by this green and this green line is going to be just the, the ATP that was stored in the muscle to begin with. So we always have a little bit of ATP in your muscle. Um, it's necessary for your muscles to relax, so it has to be there. Um, so we're just utilizing that already available ATP for that first one to three seconds. Once you start burning through that already available ATP, um, again, it was produced sometime in the past and it's just stored there. Once you burn through that, you're gonna start using the phosphocreatine system. So you can see this purple line here is gonna be going up as the stored ATP is coming down. So the purple line goes up as the green line is coming down. And then the purple line, the phosphocreatine system, is going to maintain that high level of exercise for about 15 seconds or so, give or take, depending on the person and their level of uh, fitness for the phosphocreatine system. Once we get past around 15 seconds or so, um, the phosphocreatine system would have already been plummeting um, in its, its influence on the exercise bout, and 
Meanwhile, another system has been ramping up. That new system that's been ramping up that's going to surpass the phosphocreatine system as the primary source of ATP generation, this blue line is gl called glycolysis. All right, so glycolysis is when we break down glucose, so sugars essentially in the blood uh, or in the muscles in order to make energy. All right, so you can see that when we transition from phosphocreatine in the stored ATP to glycolysis, we have a big drop off in exercise performance. All right, so exercise performance is gonna come down because the rate of energy that gets released, so how quickly we're, we're releasing the energy is going to slow down um, when we get to glycolysis as the primary energy source. It doesn't mean that it's slow, we're still talking, you know, 60 seconds, maybe up to about two minutes, where glycolysis is the primary source of energy. Um, and if you were to get up and sprint for two minutes, you would be able to sprint uh, pretty fast still. Um, so the exercise intensity is still pretty high. And we're going to see this other line here, this red line, um, which is aerobic metabolism. It's been slowly creeping up the entire time from the start of exercise until about a minute and 20 seconds, oh, sorry, about 120 seconds, so about uh, two minutes here, where it's going to surpass glycolysis as the primary energy source. All right, so if we were to back up to 60 seconds, about 70% of the energy being produced is being produced from glycolysis, this blue line. And and about 30% is being produced by aerobic metabolism, the red line. Can get up to 120 seconds or about two minutes um, is where this transition happens, where we're, we were 50-50, 50% glycolysis, 50% aerobic metabolism. And then after that, it is going to be primarily the aerobic metabolism that is going to support the exercise intensity. And so with the transition from glycolysis to more and more aerobic metabolism as the uh, energy source, we're gonna see a decrease in exercise performance uh, as that happens. So beyond two minutes, when it's mostly aerobic metabolism taking place, uh, our exercise intensity is gonna be much less than what it was during the peak of glycolysis or during the peak of phosphocreatine or the freely just stored ATP. So exercise intensity is gonna drop every time we have this transition from one energy source to another. That's going to happen because uh, each one of these subsequent energy sources just produces the energy more slowly. It's able to produce more energy over time um, so you can maintain the exercise for a very long time on glycolysis and a much, much longer time on aerobic metabolism compared to phosphocreatine, but it is the rate of the energy being produced that is the issue, which is why we have to slow down our exercise intensity when we're going to do a vigorous bout of 60 seconds or two minutes or two hours hours worth of exercise. All right, so again, this is going to cause a decreased performance due to the switching off from one energy source to another. Of note here, and we're going to talk about more of this later in this section, um, the higher the exercise intensity, the more carbs you're going to use, the lower the exercise intensity, the more fats you're going to use when we're uh, trying to exercise aerobically, so this red uh, line here. So that red line is the aerobic metabolism, but it doesn't tell us, uh, at least in this depiction, it doesn't tell us if it's carbs or fats being, uh, being utilized aerobically. So we already touched on this just a little bit, but let's just uh, emphasize this some. The speed of energy liberation, this purple line, and the total amount of possible energy liberation from each of the major uh, energy systems, so phosphocreatine, glycolysis, aerobic metabolism using carbohydrate, and aerobic metabolism using fat, um, it's going to be very different across these different energy sources. Looking at this, phosphocreatine has a very high rate of energy liberation, but a very low amount of total energy that can come from it. Glycolysis, a little bit more energy can come from it, Still very high, but not quite as high as phosphocreatine was. Um, then when we get to aerobic metabolism, whether it's carbohydrates or fat, you're gonna see that the rate of energy liberation is gonna come down dramatically from the anaerobic sources, the phosphocreatine glycolysis, but the amount of energy, the total amount of energy that can be produced through aerobic metabolism is much, much higher. So for carbohydrates, um, it is quite a bit higher than the phosphocreatine glycolysis, how much, we're talking about how much energy you can produce. When we're talking about fat, 
um, burned aerobically, the amount of energy that can be produced is so much more than any of these other ones, including carbohydrate um, aerobic metabolism, that I couldn't draw it on this figure here. So that's why I have this dotted line with the arrow pointing up because it's so, so high. It dwarfs all these other ones. Um, it, it's We have a nearly unlimited amount of energy capacity through fat metabolism. All right, so of course this is assuming a normal healthy individual with a normal amount of body fat. This isn't, we're not talking about obese individuals who, who have a lot more body fat. We're also not talking about people who uh, may be starving or something like that, but we're not talking about that either. We're talking about a normal person, um, if they are using aerobic metabolism, burning fat, they're probably not going to stop because they run out of fat. They're gonna stop because they get tired for some other reason. To highlight a few notes about each of these again, um, phosphocreatine is considered a, a immediate energy source because as soon as you run out of that stored ATP, it's going to immediately jump in and start to produce lots of, uh, lots of energy quickly. Um, glycolysis, not an immediate energy source anymore, but a fast energy source. The problem with glycolysis is if you are going really quick and you're using very vigorous intensity exercise, it's going to end with just doing the anaerobic metabolism. It's not going to go all the way through to aerobic metabolism. So in other words, it's not going to produce pyruvic acid. It's going to produce lactic acid. And lactic acid causes fatigue and burning and crampy type sensations. Um, that's what you... Uh, that's the reason why when you're exercising really hard and your muscles start to burn, you're, they're burning because you're using a lot of glycolysis. The aerobic metabolism using the uh, end product of glycolysis, so through carbohydrate breakdown, it can, can, can fuel us for moderate to vigorous intensity exercise up to about two hours for most people. All right, so this is why most people, when they say like go out and run a marathon, around the two hour mark, most people are going to hit the wall. The hitting the wall is them essentially running out of freely available carbohydrates and their body has to start producing its own carbohydrates in higher quantities and also switching to fat as an energy source, which is much slower than carbohydrate metabolism. And, the, and then fat, as mentioned, very, very slow, but a near endless amount of energy in a normal healthy person. To show some of this in a slightly different way, um, again, we have time on the x-axis here. It's not a continuous x-axis. You can see one to three seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, and then we jump to two minutes, four minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and then 120 minutes, in other words, two hours. Um, and if we were to graph this out, and we have aerobic metabolism as the green line, anaerobic metabolism as the purple line, the further you get towards that two hour mark, the, um, more aerobic, uh, the more aerobic metabolism you're doing and the less anaerobic metabolism you're doing at two hours of exercise, very, very little anaerobic metabolism taking place. Um, we're at one to three seconds of exercise, you have very, very little aerobic metabolism taking place. It's almost all anaerobic. And if I'll let you pause the video here and look at these gray dotted lines with the different um, sports listed on them. But these are the different sports that would fall somewhere in this ratio of anaerobic to aerobic metabolism. So give you a couple of these here, a 100 meter run or weightlifting, so uh, like a bench press or something like that you're gonna use almost entirely anaerobic metabolism, almost zero aerobic metabolism in order to support the exercise bout. It's just too fast and too, um, it's over too quickly and it's too vigorous of an intensity for aerobic metabolism to do anything. On the middle of this, we have like an 800 meter run, which for a good sort of high school age um, athlete, maybe college age, college age athlete, you're talking around two minutes. Um, also, boxing would be here in the middle where it's almost exactly 50% aerobic and 50% anaerobic exercise happening. And then on the far end, we're talking 10K runs, marathon runs, um, triathlons, things like that, that are going to be almost entirely aerobic metabolism and almost zero anaerobic metabolism. When thinking about aerobic exercise and endurance exercise and things like that, it's important to uh, understand the concept of a VO2 max. All right, so a VO2 max, in other words, the maximal amount of oxygen that our bodies can consume, um, is a really good indicator of exercise performance in endurance-based sports. All right, so 
graphing this out, if we have work rate going up on the x-axis, then we have oxygen consumption or VO2 on the y-axis going up. At rest, we're over here, again, around 3.5 mLs of oxygen per kilogram body mass per minute, and it's going to progress more and more and more until you hit your peak exercise where it's going to have a little bit of a plateau and no matter if you increase the work rate or not you're not going to be able to produce or you're not going to be able to consume more oxygen um, so in other words you max out your hit your capacity for aerobic metabolism so your vo2 max is going to be limited primarily by your cardiac respiratory system so in other words your heart's and vascular network's ability to get blood around the body and your pulmonary system your lungs ability to oxygenate that blood and then the other side of this would be your muscles ability to utilize that oxygen in order to produce ACP. All right, so how much blood and oxygen can you get around and then how much oxygen can you extract from that blood and then utilize those two things together are going to determine a person's VO2 max. Um, now what affects their, a person's VO2 max? It's about 50% genetics, about 50% training. So if somebody is an elite athlete, they're going to have a really good genetic profile. They're going to be really good uh, just naturally. It doesn't mean that it can be elite without training. You know, there's probably a lot of people out there walking around with elite level of genetics, but they don't train. And so, uh, at least as they get older, they're going to, they're going to lose that ability to, you know, be a uh, world caliber. Um, now on the other side of things, you can do a lot to train your VO2 max. You can improve it quite a bit, but as already mentioned, you need the genetics if you want to be an elite athlete. So they have to both be there to get the, to those elite levels. VO2 max is super important for endurance-based sports, as well as a lot of other sports too that we won't talk about as much right now. Um, but almost as important, maybe even more important, would be your lactate threshold. So it's debatable, I would say, which one's more important, but most people are probably going to lean towards the VO2 max. But still, lactate threshold is super important here. Um, so the lactate threshold, if we look at this graph here, we have an increasing aerobic work rate, and we have an increase in blood lactate on the y-axis. So this is real data from an individual. Um, we have their resting blood lactate levels, um, and if we increase their work rate over time, blood lactate levels don't do a whole lot. They eventually start to creep up a little bit, and then all of a sudden, boom, they're gonna shoot up, okay? This shooting up, uh, this period of time where that happens is called the lactate threshold. For this individual, is around 67% of their estimated VO2 max. Um, for most untrained individuals, this is going to happen somewhere between 50 and 60% of their VO2 max. For a trained person, we're talking 65 to potentially up to 80% of their VO2 max where they're going to hit that, uh, that lactate threshold. Now, the importance of the lactate threshold is this is the point in time where your body starts producing so much uh, lactic acid in the muscles that the muscles can't deal with it themselves and it starts to spill out into the bloodstream. When it starts to spill out into the bloodstream, that means the muscles are saturated with it. And if the muscles are saturated with it, it's going to start affecting the muscles' function. So the muscles, when they have a lot of lactic acid in them, are going to be burning. They're going to start to fatigue. They're going to stop responding as much to the neural stimulus, so you're going to slow down. Um, so generally speaking, if you can exercise at a high intensity and stay below your lactic threshold, you're going to be able to do that for a very long period of time, multiple hours potentially. As soon as you cross this lactic threshold and you start getting those uh, that burning, fatiguing type feeling, you're going to be at best uh, probably a handful of minutes at best. Um, and the, the higher you go, the shorter period of time you're going to be able to maintain that. So the lactic threshold is super important because below it, you can exercise for a long time without feeling fatigued. Above it, you're not going to be able to exercise very long at all before you have to stop or slow down your exercise intensity. So if somebody has a high lactic threshold relative to their own VO2 max, that means they're going to be able to exercise at a higher intensity without feeling fatigued, which for a lot of sports is going to be super beneficial. Some similar concepts to the lactate threshold that you're probably going to hear, so some other terms are going to be the ventilatory threshold. So the ventilatory threshold um, is going to happen at the same point in time as the lactic threshold. They are linked together. The lactic threshold causes the ventilatory threshold. So the ventilatory threshold is essentially when your body starts to deal with the lact this lactic acid that gets into the blood using the bicarbonate system, and that bicarbonate goes into the lungs, splits off, and creates CO2 that we then have to breathe out. Your ventilation is going to skyrocket at the same point in time. So below the, the lactate threshold or the ventilatory threshold, 
the ventilation is going to be a little slower, a little more controlled. Above it, you're going to get a lot more of that um, excessive ventilation that's going to be very labored breathing that's going to take place, the kind of things that we associate with very intense bouts of exercise or sort of fatiguing exercise. All right, so one more concept I want to throw out or one more term I want to throw out that essentially means the same thing as the lactic threshold or the ventilatory threshold is the anaerobic threshold. The anaerobic threshold is just a sort of generic term. It's an umbrella term for these other two, the ventilatory and the lactic threshold. So they, they all happen at the same time. They're somewhat synonymous with one another. What are some things that cause a person to hit their lactic threshold? So in other words, if you could approve these, you would have a higher lactic threshold. The first one is going to be low muscle oxygen or hypoxemia. Uh, or hypoxia. So if you have a low amount of oxygen in the muscle, that means you're going to be forced to use anaerobic metabolism. If you're using anaerobic metabolism, you're probably going to be using a lot of glycolysis, which is what produces the lactic acid. All right. So other things or anything that's going to accelerate glycolysis, including hypoxia, um, is going to cause more lactic acid to be produced. But basically what's happening is you're going to produce a lot of NADH, and you're also going to be producing a lot of pyruvic acid. If there's a lot of NADH uh, sitting around and a lot of pyruvic acid sitting around, those two are able to interact with one another and produce lactic acid. All right. If there's not a lot of these sitting around, that means it's being shuttled into the Krebs cycle and aerobic metabolism, and aerobic metabolism is keeping up with the exercise intensity that you're doing. All right, so that's a good thing that's gonna prevent the production of lactic acid, preventing the burning, the fatigue, and all those things that come with it. So increasing your body's ability to take in the NADH and pyruvic acid into aerobic metabolism is going to reduce the lactic acid that's produced. Um, also, if you are recruiting more of the fast switch muscle fibers, it's going to produce more lactic acid. So the fast switch muscle fibers are the ones that are not as fatigue resistant. They use a lot more anaerobic metabolism. They have um, the fast switch muscle fibers have an isoenzyme of the lactic, uh, the, the lactate dehydrogenase, which is the enzyme that actually produces the lactic acid by combining the NADH and the pyruvic acid. It has a version of this lactate dehydrogenase that is a little faster and has a greater affinity for pyruvic acid, which in other words means the, the lactate dehydrogenase is more likely to interact with the pyruvic acid, producing lactic acid in fast twitch muscle fibers than slow twitch muscle fibers. It has a different form, a different isoenzyme of the lactate dehydrogenase. Um, also, if you have a reduced rate of lactate, lactate removal or lactic acid removal um, from the blood, that's going to eventually cause the blood lactate levels to spike and you've hit your lactic threshold. A lot of people who are um, high level athletes, especially high level endurance athletes, they're going to have their VO2 max measured and they're going to have their blood lactate um, thresholds measured um, as a, again, a percentage of their VO2 max or as a absolute workload when they typically hit it. And so the reason for this is completely Combining VO2 max uh, data with lactic threshold data uh, is going to give a really good idea of what this person's performance level is going to be like so you get an idea of what their exercise capacity or athletic capacity is. The other reason why people oftentimes measure lactic thresholds is to um, be able to then train the individual to improve their lactic threshold. So anytime you work a system, that system is going to get better. If you know someone's lactic threshold, you can then prescribe them to do exercise that is near, uh, either just below or just at or just above their lactic threshold, and that's going to force their body to adapt in order to raise their lactic threshold over time. So um, oftentimes you'll hear, um, especially distance runners, say threshold runs or tempo runs, they're talking about running at a pace that is near their lactic threshold in order to improve the lactic threshold. I want to take a little side note here and talk about muscle soreness um, and because a lot of people are going to talk about muscle soreness when they talk about lactic acid. All right, so there's a term called DOMS or delayed onset of muscle soreness. Typically, um, if you do a really intense bout of exercise, 24 to 48 hours after that exercise bout is where your soreness is going to peak. You're going to be most sore a day to two days later. Um, you're going to have some soreness during and immediately after the exercise bout if it's intense enough, but again, the peak of soreness is going to happen a day or two later. 
this is something that um, your strength and power athletes are probably going to be experiencing on a fairly regular basis because their exercise intensities are so high. Um, they're doing such uh, high workloads when they exercise. It's going to produce a lot of DOMS. Um, your health and fitness enthusiasts, people who just exercise to you know stay healthy or to lose weight, they probably won't experience DOMS very often. In reality, they should experience it almost never because it's just it's not necessary for their exercise goals. Um, but the point is. Most people who are going to exercise at some point in time are going to experience DOMS. And so what causes DOMS? What causes this onset of muscle soreness that comes a day or two later? Um, and most people in the lay public are going to blame this on lactic acid. So if we look at the same graph that we looked at before, whether you do a um, recovery, so you, whether you do an, a cool down or don't do a cool down, it's not going to affect how much lactic acid is in your system with you know an hour to two hours to three hours later. So it's definitely not going to affect how much lactic acid is in your system a day to two to three days later, right? Um, so within about two hours, the lactic acid is typically back down to normal resting levels. So if there's no lactic acid or if the lactic acid is no uh, no greater than what it was before the exercise bout, then it can't be the the cause of soreness that happens a day or two days from now. All right, so lactic acid is going to be associated with fatigue and burning and a little bit of soreness in the hour to two hours after the exercise bout, but a day to two days later, lactic acid is not the cause of that soreness. All right, so what is the cause of that soreness? So it's essentially um, when we damage the muscle with the exercise, that's what's causing the soreness. So if we look here, we have uh, an image of a normal sarcomere. So sarcomere is the functional unit of muscle. So essentially we have actin and myosin overlapping, which is causing these striations, these, these band patterns here. And if we take uh, this muscle fiber and we were to make it contract on itself, what you would see is this Z line here and this Z line here would get closer together. All right, so this Z line would come and pull over towards this other Z line, and that contraction, that shortening, that's actually what muscle contraction is. All right, so it's a lot of sarcomeres, one after the next, pulling in on themselves. Again, this is a normal, healthy sarcomere here, one that has no damage to it. When you exercise, and you're constantly working this sarcomere, bringing it towards itself, relaxing, bringing it towards itself, relaxing, um, this is going to cause some damage eventually, especially with higher intensity exercise, as already mentioned uh, when I was talking up here. This damage is going to look like a streaming, like a somebody, it, so this is a microscope image. If you were to look at the same image after somebody's done an intense amount of exercise, it's going to look like somebody just kind of smudged the image. All right? the, these nice orderly lines stop being there and it just looks smeared and smudged. Um, and so, sometimes you'll hear people say sarcoma streaming. That's what they're talking about, the sort of the smearing, the streaming effect of the sarcomeres. And that is literally microscopic damage to the muscle, and that's what causes muscle soreness. If you want to see an image of a damaged sarcomere from a normal exercise belt, um, the kind that would create DOMS, um, you can scan this QR code here or go to this website here and go to figure two. It's a, a research article that shows a nice figure of a normal sarcomere. Um, it's zoomed out a little bit from this, so it looks a little different from this, um, but it has a normal sarcomere pattern, and then it has, it points out a lot of areas of microscopic damage from exercise. Um, and so you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, before you start thinking this microscopic damage is a bad thing, we need this in order to get exercise adaptations. So if you want the muscle to rebuild stronger, you had to have broken it down or it won't rebuild. Right? So you want a little bit of microscopic level damage to the muscle fibers so you can rebuild those muscle fibers and build them stronger the next time. Now what you don't want is to do uh, repetitive bouts of exercise that are so intense that it's going to cause a lot of damage to these muscle fibers without giving enough rest in between. If you don't give enough rest, that eventually will cause a muscle injury. But again, this microscopic injuries that I'm talking about now, this is normal, this is healthy, this is what you want with exercise.
I'm gonna go ahead and stop this part of the this section here. So we're gonna have a part one and then probably just a one a part two video coming after this where we're gonna talk about um, how you measure exercise metabolism. So this was um, what our bodies are doing and how exercise uh, affects metabolism. We're gonna talk about how you measure exercise metabolism in part two of this section. All right, so come back and watch that video. If you have any questions or comments about this one though, you can put those in the comment section below and I'll try to get back to you. Otherwise, please come back and watch another video. Thanks.